on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program David Hussein. He is a lecturer of history at Yale University and author of Progressive Inequality, Rich and Poor in New York, 1890 to 1920. Welcome to the program, David. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. All right, so let's let's start with um, uh, just, if you could, just tell us about the progressive movement and the and the progressive era, just so that uh, everyone is on the same page uh, as to uh, what we mean by progressives uh, when we talk historically. Sure. So usually, when when people invoke the progressive era, they're thinking about a variety of uh, reformers, um, people who sort of grappled with the merciless nature of uh, unrestrained industrial capitalism from the Gilded Age and tried to sort of rein it in through a variety of, of uh, social reform movements in cities um, uh, across the country and through legislation as well that uh, sort of, you know, applied some kind of regulatory apparatus to to industrial capitalist businesses. Um, so there are a lot of different ways of understanding the progressives, and there are a lot of different kinds of people that fall under that category. And part of the reason that I wrote the book is that um, I think there, there's a tendency to to think of progressives in uh, very positive terms and, and um, to generally forget the kind of white supremacist race theory part of progressivism, the eugenics part of progressivism, um, all of which came under that heading at the time as well. And, and so, I mean, what, uh, give me a sense of, of why you think that there is, I mean, why do we have these misconceptions? I mean, in part because that's largely the way the history is is written. Um, there's also the fact, you know, which I should state at the outset, that uh, there were a lot of progressive reformers that did a bunch of good, a uh, bunch of um, sort of transformed the conditions of, of life for a lot of Americans in positive ways. You know, you have the introduction of the the beginnings of the progressive income tax, uh, various legislation to, to control sanitary environment and workplace, workers' compensation, um, introduction of restrictions on child labor, and so forth. Um, so that's part of the reason I think people prefer, <laughs> Americans tend to look at the happy side of their history uh, rather than the, the difficult parts. Right. Um, and, 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 and to be fair as well, I mean, that um, those elements of of, uh, of of racism um, uh, were 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 certainly not exclusive to the progressive movement. No, absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, although I think part of the again part of the reason that that I wanted to write the book is to sort of lend a little bit more of a, a critical sense to the fact that a lot of the a lot of the best progressives, a lot of the people that we remember as the best progressives, people like Lillian Wald, who founded the the Henry Street Settlement, um, and you know even some housing reformers uh, who who really were trying to uh, create a better world in on you know say on the Lower East Side and these tenement conditions that everybody remembers as sort of being you know terrible and you know all the children having diphtheria and no one having adequate food and you know ten people living in a single room um, they were creatures of their time um, and they expressed and enacted a whole variety of of kind of racism imperialism that were just part of the part of the language of the time um, and that had consequences and that's that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, is that the progressive era ultimately didn't work? It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, and and I, and I want to get there, but I, I want to uh, start with sort of and, and and certainly there are sort of parallels in terms of what um, I mean. The, it, the the progressive era grew out of an awareness of a tremendous uh, disparity, wealth disparity, income disparity um, uh, within the country, and. And I, I, let's just start, though. I mean, w w talk about that, because uh, I, I want to lead up to that opening scene in your book, uh, which is uh, which I think sort of encapsulates sort of the the limits of of what progressivism was about at that time. But 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 talk about the inequality that existed at that time. Sure. So, um, you know, inequality in the 1890s was, um, uh, you know, in numerical terms, actually, uh, not quite as bad as it is today. Um, but it was 
certainly uh, in terms of a lived reality, um, very obvious. You had these you know, piling up of tremendous fortunes, outsized fortunes that, that dwarf anything um, that exists today. Even people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett don't have the kind of relative wealth of someone like John D., what John D. Rockefeller had at the beginning of the, the 1890s. I mean, you're talking he had about 5% of the entire GDP as his personal wealth. Um, which today would be something on the order of three quarters of a trillion dollars. Um, you know, that's sort of a facile comparison. But, but in any case, you had a real sort of uh, environment in which industrial workers were living in misery and want and um, dying at a, an amazing clip on the job. About 35,000 a year um, died in the workplace or were killed uh, uh, just by the conditions of their work. Um, and on the other hand, these vast fortunes um, that sort of give the name to the Gilded Age. And I think part of what happened in that period before the Progressive Era was that um, you had workers beginning to organize and beginning to lash out violently against these kinds of inequalities um, uh, and also to defend themselves against the violence of both the state and um, capitalist businessmen who were using it pretty ruthlessly against them. Um, and that sort of surge in industrial violence through the 1880s and 1890s made wealthy people begin to think to themselves, hey, we better, uh, we better actually do something about this expanding inequality because it seems like it's, getting the, it's, it's undermining the foundations of the system that has made us so wealthy. Um, and you know, the impulse of the progressive era and all of those reform movements does come in part from this burgeoning recognition on the part of of wealthy Americans that hey we need to we need to figure out some solutions for this inequality and it's not it's not dissimilar to to what's going on right now. Yeah, I mean obviously um and it, it, the the level of violence in terms of the way that the workers uh responded it was obviously far greater than than today. Um Oh, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, you know, and it's it's part of that comes from a sense that violence is actually uh, you know, at the time, people felt that violence might be a, a productive avenue for resistance. Um, and indeed, it was. <laughs> it was more effective then than it could possibly be now, um, in part because the, you know, the apparatus of state violence was much less well-developed in the 1890s and 19 aughts than it is today. I mean, when you, you know, compare the size of, of say, just the New York City Police Department, um, today, workers trying to do things like, you know, subway workers in the uh, in 1916, um, disgruntled subway workers set a bomb in the Lenox Avenue subway station um, to destroy company property, um, with the idea that this would sort of garner some sympathy uh, from the general public, and it was not entirely misguided at the time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what people don't understand is sort of the level. I mean, there were uh, bombs set off uh, on Wall Street. I mean, this was uh, the... That's right. I think we forget uh, sort of just how militant things were at that time. Uh, and I guess the, the upshot is that um, uh, there's a growing awareness of the implications of this inequality without that level of, uh, of violence, at least coming from... Uh, those who are suffering from the inequality. Um, I mean, the dynamic is very different, I think, uh, today in terms of, uh, you know, if you look at Occupy, you see the, the, the level of sort of, I think, violence that came from the, from the, the authorities. Um, right, right. Although, I mean, there's a different kind of violence right. in, in, in contemporary society that, that you know, is, is, you know, our progressive era forebears would have looked at and, and been, you know, somewhat aghast when you think about the the incarceration rate in the twenty in twenty first century United States. You had nothing like that in the in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, and that's a form of state violence that pervades our society. I mean, in every city in the country, uh, you know, there are there are hundreds of thousands of families that that are affected in some way by by incarceration and the violence of incarceration. And that is a form of inequality that reproduces itself in lived experience for all these Americans, right? Yes, indeed. In fact, um, uh, we had uh, Matt Taibbi on, um, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago now, talking about sort of that dynamic that, uh, right. and, 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 and certainly others, uh, Glenn Greenwald has, has written about that as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but so let's get back to the opening of, of, uh, of your book, because I think this sort of captures um, the, uh, 
the the, uh, the 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 sort of the conflict uh the inner conflict i guess of yeah. of that was embedded in the uh progressive movement the sort of doing uh attempting to do the right thing but maybe not necessarily for the best of reasons i don't know i i, I, <laughs> I don't know what the best way to characterize it but tell the story it's hard about, to characterize it because uh, uh, it's kind of a crazy story about madison square garden because right. it's it, it it's it's like it's i mean it's obviously from another time but it's like it's from another planet uh it, it, it describe uh, just tell us that story sure sure so uh christmas day 1899 um the salvation army decided to you know organize a charity event in Madison Square Garden. And what they did was uh, they invited New York's poor, quote unquote. Um, Let, let's go back. I, I just want to go be like, wh- you know, just characterize what the Salvation Army is at that time. I mean, I mean because this seems to, to, to go to the heart of this on some level is that the, the you know, philanthropy and charity, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so 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 back up and just g- give us a little context on the on the Salvation Army of the time. Sure. So the Salvation Army had had really just uh, arrived in the United States 17 years earlier um, and had gotten its feet under it. It was uh, a charity that was looking to essentially, uh, you know, up, give succor to the lives of the poor um, uh, in various cities. It had started in England and and you know landed with big fanfare in in the United States uh, in New York actually um, in 1882 and and um, it was trying to address the kinds of urban inequality that uh, were were typical of uh, this emerging industrial capitalist landscape um, you know terrible housing uh, unemployment um, real kind of misery and want in poorer sections of the city and the things that they would do is they would establish homes for young girls who had become pregnant or you know they tried to there was a real a really strong evangelist component to the Salvation Army as well as there still is today um, it was an ev- evangelical Christian organization that was trying to transform the way people uh, poor people thought about themselves and about their world and really changed their behavior. And that's a key element in a lot of progressive reform. Um, You know, this desire on the part of charity do-gooders to uh, instruct the poor in how they can they can better behave themselves and better act so as to take advantage of, of the growing wealth of that period. So, um, you know, this, the, in, in service of that, the Salvation Army set up this dinner, um, in Madison Square Garden, and they invited New York's poor to come and eat dinner on the arena floor. Um, and they uh, sold tickets for one dollar a piece to wealthy New Yorkers to come and sit in the mezzanine and watch the meal as an act of charity. Um, and this is one of the most amazing things about the event for me is that you have wealthy people coming to this event, and you know, basically an event that is class voyeurism in its most naked form. Um, and they imagine themselves to be doing a great charitable deed, um, to be, you know, really creating a certain kind of atmosphere of understanding between between themselves and and the poor. Um, and there are some sort of strange little uh, uh, anomalies in this event that that indicate that maybe something else is going on. Like, for instance, some of the poor attendees take uh, dinner baskets out onto the street outside the arena, and rather than going home in gratitude, they set up these impromptu poultry markets and try to sell the chickens for uh, a nickel apiece. Um, And the cops come outside and basically scatter them. Um, And the press the next day essentially called them ungrateful rather than, you know, I mean, today they might be celebrated as entrepreneurs, right? Right. Um, and, and, and what what other thing? I mean, first off, it's just a, such a jaw dropping uh, <laughs> a story, and it, 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 but it also serves as a metaphor for, uh, in in some respects, for the I guess the, um, the 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 problem with progressivism at that in that day and age because it it. Um, I mean, it speaks to its limits, but it also talks about why it could never surpass its limits, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, part of that is just the, the, the sort of obsession with, with private philanthropy or private charity as the solution to uh, wealth and income inequality that, you know, a lot of people who are devoted to an idea of, of a free market society tend to subscribe to, right? Um, you know, charity has real 
political limits um, in terms of, of the kind of good it can do. And that certainly, you know, if people out there are listening and have lots of money, they should certainly feel feel free to be charitable and, and they can make a difference in the world. But in terms of actually changing the structural dynamics of inequality in the United States, um, it, it is not going to do it. Um, and I think that's one of the... Well, it has, it has political take. and pragmatic limitations. I mean, you know, it's, it's great Christmas dinner, uh, but... The the fact that people went out to sell the chickens shows right. the, pr- the the practical limitations on it because they were thinking I'm also going to have to eat on New Year's Day I'm going to have <laughs> to eat in uh, February in March and in April and May I mean that's that I mean that's what that part of the story mm, what foresight tells. exactly I mean I think that that you know uh, you know and I had this um, I've had this argument um, in the past with. Uh, different libertarians that I've had the opportunity to sort of debate on these things as to charity's capacity uh, to handle this. And, 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 and according to them, you know, all history stopped, I think, you know, after, you know, uh, prior to 1975 or something. But, uh, right, right. you know, this was charity was doing a great job uh, of, right. of dealing with. Right. No, you get this kind of like strange a historical nostalgia for some halcyon age that never existed. I mean, you don't even need to look further than David Brooks column in The Times today. Right. It, well, I, 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 I couldn't look that far, to be honest with you. That, that, that's a bridge too far for me. But, but no, but it, 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 it captured it actually captured the voice of of many progressives that I write about. Um, you know, Brooks is in this mode of both kind of celebrating the possibilities of, of libertarian entrepreneurship for the poor, um, and at the same time saying, well, you know, you can't really give uh, these family tax credits to uh, people who don't know how to act because the culture has really deteriorated. And what we need is paternalist programs. He actually uses the word paternalism um, to describe the kind of programs that need to be put in place in order to address inequality. Well, and I- he's celebrating it. I, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves because I think that that's sort of the interesting thing <laughs> is, uh, uh, about today's politics is that we almost have gradations of the um, w- what was problematic about the progressives at that time. And they, those gradations span, I think, from uh, our president, frankly, uh, all mm-hmm. the way to, to, to Paul Ryan and beyond, uh, if yeah. you're moving that way rightward on the spectrum. But, but before we get there, tell us, okay, so you've got thousands of people who come into uh, Madison Square Garden uh, to mm-hmm. basically perform eating uh, yes. uh, for uh, these wealthy donors. Um, and I guess presumably this was the way, this was sort of almost like, I don't know. It was almost like watching Sally Struthers, right, uh, on TV, <laughs> and it allows uh, these rich people to see what their money can do, uh, That's right. how much happiness it can bring. But give us a sense of of just like wh- how, and, and and you write specifically about New York, but it, it, New York may be sort of the uh, uh, the most extreme in some respects or uh, um, example of of both the inequality and the 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 uh, the level of deprivation but give us a sense of what it was like at that time because you know I again I've had these uh, uh, debates with libertarians where I'm saying you know uh, charity may have been working but there were like 20,000 people sleeping literally on the Bowery uh, right, around that right. time give us a sense of what 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 New York was like at that time okay so uh just, you know, one statistic that always kind of jumps out at me is that uh, on the Lower East Side and many of these most you know, densely populated war, uh, uh, urban areas in the world, actually, in the history of the world, um, uh, they were among the most densely populated and way more densely populated than today. I mean, people think Manhattan is a zoo now. Uh, you know, it was it was uh, a third again as populous um, in, in 1890 through that period. Um, you had uh, uh, 20% of uh, children dying. They didn't call it the infant mortality rate. They called it the, the child death rate. They were much less euphemistic. Um, but a fifth of kids, every fifth child, died of some communicable disease. Um, diphtheria, uh, diarrhea, um, typhoid, uh, yellow fever, um, it, it, all sorts of diseases that are easily cured by, uh, you know, or addressed by um, uh, medical professionals and were then as well, many of them. Um, uh, because there was no apparatus to give them health care. And that's one of the things that Lillian Wald brought to the Lower East Side. In terms of housing, you certainly had, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, libertarian's dream of unregulated uh, uh, garment production. 
that it created a whole sweatshop neighborhoods where you had families working in tiny cramped buildings, apartments, producing garments for major garment manufacturers and then delivering them, you know, in hopes that their their houses didn't burn down, which was a real problem because there was an arson uh, ring running around New York in the early 1890s, basically taking advantage of the fact that people had so little sense of connection or affection for the places that they lived that they would take, uh, they would get them to take insurance policies out on them and then burn them to the ground and split the proceeds because the fire insurance uh, market was so uh, so badly regulated or practically unregulated. And so, and so, is- so you'd have an apartment <laughs> building or a tenement house, I guess, where, I don't know, 30 apartments, one or two people might do that uh, to take the insurance out, right? And then so the other mm-hmm. 28 um, families, they just lose out. Right. I mean, I tell a story at the, the, you know, near the beginning of the book as well about a saloon owner who, you know, his saloon was in a tenement and on the bottom floor, and he couldn't make the payments uh, on his his Budweiser taps, which he had leased. And he he did this. He engaged in one of these these arson fraud um, arrangements with uh, a sort of handy criminal. And a four-year-old girl in one of the tenement apartments died because the fire got out of control and the building burned to the ground. And, you know, the guy was then ultimately, uh, the, the saloon owner actually made his escape to Europe with his, with his cut of the proceeds. But the guy that he worked with was tried and, and then sentenced um, uh, to, I believe, life in prison. So, uh, so that just gives people just sort of a sense. I mean, the, the, the idea of one in five children dying uh, and, and not because uh, as a function of both the conditions they're living in and their lack of access to health care that could have prevented those deaths or at least a certain percentage, a significant percentage of them, even though they were exposed to stuff that they uh, wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. Um, right. It just gives people, I think, a sense of, of what's going on. And then meanwhile, uh, just blocks away, uh, less than a couple of miles away, people are living uh, in some of the most exquisite mansions, I imagine, and, and living a lifestyle that even in in other parts of this country were, would be unimaginable. Um, yes, and some of those mansions, you know, I mean, when you, if, if, you know, any of your listeners are in New York and haven't been to the Frick Museum, um, you know, that mansion is still there, and it's a, it's a sort of indication of how that wealthy class lived at the time um, uh, on, on Fifth Avenue. It's, it's sort of unbelievably remarkable in its opulence. Okay, so let's talk about what the progressive uh, program was at that point, because I think the 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 book essentially tells the story of the 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 progressive movement was effective in some respects, but largely in its largest program, I guess, or its large largest um, uh, uh, rationale was not effective. And it had to do with this notion of of focusing on the individual. Uh, so let's let's get into that that aspect of it. Right. So uh, you know, ascribing one goal to to progressivism or to progressives is always pretty tricky. But I think in general, you can say that that you know the progressive movement in all its various forms was a reaction to the kinds of exacerbated inequality that that characterized the period, and that was sort of the goal of a lot of different progressive organizations was we need to we need to redress this inequality we need to figure out how to make it better um, how to make conditions for workers better uh, you know not least of all so that they stop blowing things up in anger um, uh, or you know organizing into pesky unions um, and uh, you know in in that respect you you do see uh, sort of some successes right I talk about in the book, the strike of the shirtwaist workers in 1909 to 1910, a very famous strike in U.S. labor history um, that sets the groundwork for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union um, and who ultimately, with the amalgamated workers, uh, uh, garment workers, form the basis for the CIO in the 1930s, right? So there you have a, a direct kind of connection between the progressive era uh, you know, progressive era democratic activism and the moment in U.S. history when inequality really starts being addressed um, more comprehensively through the state and through worker organization. Um, but then you also have all of these wealthy people who are trying to teach poor people how to act. 
um, or to control their behavior, whether through housing regulation, you know, not allowed to put stuff on the fire escape, um, with, you know, nary a worry about what that means in terms of, well, where do we put our stuff? Do we just not have stuff? Um, uh, you know, regulation to change the the construction of buildings rather than to change landlords' responsibility for their property. Um, you have all sorts of efforts to uh, to transform the material lives of workers that um, involve workers changing their behavior rather than the state providing them with some kind of greater protection or greater resources. And, 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 and that includes also like an education. In other words, um, th- it's not simply uh, you've got to put on a nicer tie or you have to uh, speak more eloquently. Uh, there was a, a broader program, which sounds, I think, you know, at first blush uh, to be, you know, sort of, well, if we, we, we have the proper uh, worker training, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. And um, the, the point is, is that a, a lot of uh, the gains that we made in those areas are actually not are a function of other gains that we have made uh, that the progressives didn't push. In other words, they did not push. They and I think, again, going back to that Madison Square uh, Garden story. Right. They uh, provided the food, but they specifically would not provide the structures for wh- where the um, uh, the workers and people who were not working, obviously, could right. empower themselves. They this was uh, right. as much about maintaining control uh, mm-hmm. as anything else. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know you see that in. It, it's sort of there's an ideological adherence to the idea of the free market and the the state that does not intervene, and um, you know in that sense it is very much of a of a piece with contemporary libertarianism. Um, you know a lot of these folks were raised uh, and educated themselves on um, the idea, the sort of classical laissez-faire economic view. And so they were not interested in a st- I mean, we, you talk about people remember the progressive era as a moment in the United States. And I think, you know, Thomas Piketty, whose book is, is sort of doing a lot of good business these days, um, talks about this, that, you know, the U.S. invented the progressive income tax in, um, you know, 1913. I believe. And, uh, you know, the reality of that progressive income tax was at the time the top marginal rate was 6%. You can't really fund a comprehensive educational program of the kind that you start seeing in the 30s and 40s with a 6% top marginal rate. Um, It just doesn't cut it. And I think that's, you know, that's part of what we're debating today, again, um, is this question of how, how powerful should state intervention be in redistributing economic goods and 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 it would go for beyond. purposes like education right well i mean i think you uh, in, a, in a piece that you um uh, that you wrote uh, w- uh, about pr- what progressives taught us not uh, w- uh, what not to do you make right. the point that and and, and here's where i want to sort of bring it up to today because um we can attribute this dynamic uh this sense of like we will. Uh, we can teach uh, the poor and the misbegotten and the the unemployed new skills. We can give them mm-hmm. education. We can provide charity, um, right. and even even charity in the sense of like we can redistribute some of our highest, uh, you know, uh, in in our highest income strata. We can redistribute that. But so I would say that the. The reluctance to actually really engage in what needs to be done is not just libertarian, but it's also neoliberal in the way that we sort of refer to neoliberal in this country. So, yeah, uh, and that's that's a reflection as well of something that was very current in the progressive era, which was this idea that you know economic growth is the answer to to all our all our ills, um, which is you know it's sort of sort of heresy to to contradict that, but you know the the idea that that we must grow, we must grow. Um, you know, I think the, the the new reform agenda coming out of the right is this. Um, you know, their their uh, uh, new document is called "Room for Growth," um, and that focus on economic growth is very much very very neoliberal. And that's why you see these kinds of efforts to privatize education through charter schools. And um, you know, ostensibly you're going to be teaching poor people how to readjust their lives through the mechanisms of the market, rather than than 
through some kind of more communal democratic process. Exactly. And, and you make the, the, the point uh, that um, the things like a, a broader education, things like um, all the things that we sort of talk about now in terms of, uh, of providing uh, broad social mobility actually came as a function not of trying to enhance the individual's social mobility, but of broad structural reforms that actually followed after the progressive movement. And it, as if, on some level, that the right. progressive movement sort of set the table and did some of the work in terms of sort of the broad political um, um, uh, sort of narratives, but the... Uh, creating the idea of the regulatory state, basically, but not actually following through on it in any kind of comprehensive fashion that would have really addressed inequality. But the idea was there. The, the, the sort of intellectual foundation was there. And then what you had was millions of workers organizing uh, in opposition to the conditions that they were suffering under during the Depression, I mean, during the Depression and before, that gave FDR and the New Dealers the kind of political capital they needed to actually make broad interventions um, and, you know, really start regulating industry and, and giving the workers the protection that they needed in order to bargain collectively for, for a decent and dignified life. And and that seems to be what's what's genuinely missing. I mean, you know, it, it's funny because today there was a story in the Washington Post about about Bill Gates uh, and the uh, sort of his uh, push of the Common Core, and uh, we talk about uh, charter schools, and and charter schools are sort of it seems to me to be the perfect example of that sort of Madison Square Garden dynamic again. Mm -hmm. where you have hedge funders and uh, wealthy elites going in and providing education for only 6% of, uh, of, the, of, of New York's uh, kids, but they're bringing in a lot of private resources. They're giving these specific individuals a chance, but they're doing it at the expense of public education across the board uh, in the city and, and leaving out Obviously, people who don't have, you know, rewarding only those families, let's say, mm -hmm. who have the social capital to work within the system that they're talking about, whether or not they have uh, like a family structure that allows the parents to go in and, in, 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 and get involved in the lottery and go to the different meetings that they have to go to, or whether or not the kid's just lucky enough to have parents who uh, are willing to, to make that kind of sacrifice or savvy enough to make that kind of sacrifice. Right, I mean, I was going to say luck plays, I'm glad you mentioned luck because luck plays an enormous role in, in, that sort of situation, and it's something that, that most people are never willing to engage with as sort of a major factor in life outcome <laughs> um, in the United States. Everybody think it comes down to, to hard work and, you know, this idea of social capital or, or you know, a sense of, of savviness, and certainly that contributes, but there is this enormous degree of luck involved, and I think that, you know, the fact that charter schools are, um, you know, in terms of their spaces, uh, is what I think one of the, you know, most kind of troubling aspects of the charter movement is the way that they they actually do take all of this public funding and that public funding gets funneled away from uh, the public educational system um, the broader public education system I want to be careful though because you know I do feel like there are a lot of devoted teachers who who try to to make a difference in charter schools and you know work very hard and so forth um, you know I have some friends who teach at charter schools but I, I think the movement as a whole you're absolutely right um, it it's it's a it's sort of an abandonment of the idea of um, a, a really broad and successful public educational system, basically through the idea that, you know, again, this neoliberal idea that if you organize things privately through, uh, you know, and uh, allow management to operate privately, it will be more efficient than if run uh, through the government, um, which people just sort of assume and accept as, as a basic truism, um, and it's just not true. Well, I mean, aside from it being sort of uh, quantifiably untrue, I mean, we, we now, you know, we, we there's plenty of research about the inefficiency of private prisons, uh, the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the famous story of Chicago selling off their um, uh, their meter reading, their their par parking meter revenues for uh, for 75 years at a 
basically a, a billion a shy of where they should have, uh, <laughs> what they should have been. Um, right. I mean, on and on. But to cover be- a short-term budget deficit, right? Indeed. And But beyond that, what it also does is it disempowers our, 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 our government in some fashion, which then also has the impact of making it impossible to make those structural reforms that would provide a broad relief across the board to as many people as possible. So, you know, uh, while we can all show up at Madison Square Garden and watch uh, a couple of thousand people eat their Christmas dinner, meanwhile, these people don't have dinners for the rest of the year, and there's thousands more who didn't get into into Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. But everybody leaves there feeling like we've done something. That's right. And they get to actually they get to actually use that as as political and social capital to continue operating the way that they do. And honestly, you know, I mean, we talk about that Madison Square Garden uh, event as as strange and jaw dropping. And, and, um, you know, but I was I came across that piece of research back in 2004. And um, right around the same time, the RNC uh, was going on in New York City. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was the kind of compassionate conservative moment. And you had uh, this major photo op with a whole bunch of Republican delegates to the RNC um, at a soup kitchen in Harlem, Um, you know, basically having their picture taken, giving out food to, to, you know, the the physical embodiment, the public embodiment of poverty in in New York. and, you know, the dynamics of that were not dissimilar to, to what was going on in Madison Square Garden. And I think that's part of the reason that I wrote the book is that, you know, I, I really did see this kind of resonance between the progressive era and our own day in a and, whole bunch of different ways. And again, we can see this in Paul Ryan uh, uh, telling us his made up story about um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the poor child who would rather not have a, a lunch uh, given right. to him, but rather just one made in a brown bag at home. I mean, it, the story turns out to be a total fabrication. But even right. if we were to take it as true, uh, it still sort of shows this mentality. And I would also argue that uh, President Obama, uh, you know, in in talking to uh, the uh, to the black community and saying that, you mm-hmm. know, this is about you pulling yourself up with your bootstraps and being socially responsible. That's all well and good. But more of that social responsibility comes once you have the foundation of of a a, a broad structure that empowers you. That's true. And I think it's also, you know, that also speaks to the the kind of relentless individualism of the approaches from both the Democratic and the Republican Party and the way that they, you know, kind of narrate the American dream. It's all about people, individuals working hard, um, right, rather than about how we as a society decide uh, there is a level beneath which there is a level of poverty and want beneath which we will not allow any citizen in our country to fall. And I think there are other developed countries in the world that that have made a collective decision around that question, um, and the decision has been to have that level be much much higher than, than right. And the, and it goes beyond even even a a safety net. It goes uh, or a, a a floor. It also goes to like how inevitably we are going to tilt the playing field because uh, the existence of government necessarily will tilt the playing field. It's just a question of in which direction it's going to tilt it. And, you That's know, right. And I think we see this even today in the uh, student loan uh, mm-hmm. argument. I mean, uh, there is, there's another option that no one speaks of, you know, aside from just sort of uh, providing some loan relief, that is offer free education. And yeah. <laughs> then all of this becomes moot. Um, but, but those words cannot be spoken, apparently. No, uh, well, and they also, they also require a... a politically toxic answer, which is massive redistribution. You can't provide a free education unless the, the, the government is actually willing to have confiscatory taxes. And I think that's something that, that that's why everybody is freaking out about Thomas Piketty is that the, you know, this wild idea that you actually take the wealth of some people who are enormously wealthy and apply it to the benefit of the larger community through some tried and true methods. Um, you know, and you saw that argument for the reason that we don't have single payer health care. Right. Right. Um, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same problem. Um, everybody has to all Democrats and Republicans alike have to speak the language of the market, um, or at least they believe they do. 
in order to be electable, or perhaps it's only in order to uh, get reasonable campaign contributions, which is another way of saying to be electable. Indeed. David Hussein, uh, the uh, book is Progressive Inequality, Rich and Poor in New York, 1890 to 1920. Thanks so much for your time today. Genuinely appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sam. I really appreciate being on. 